our presentation, we're going to be taking a look at what is perhaps, uh, I would say, maybe even you could drop the perhaps, what is um, almost certainly one of the most misunderstood, and not just the most misunderstood, but one of the most tragically misunderstood teachings in all of Scripture, and that is the topic of hell. And we're going to take a look at it from a variety of, of different perspectives, biblical perspectives. We're also going to just sort of apply our brains, which of course we're always doing when we're looking at Scripture. And we're going to just kind of ask some logical questions like, does that make sense? And uh, we'll find that when we apply our own thinking and just sort of some common sense, especially based on the picture that we've been developing of who God is, and what does this water bottle represent here on the table of truth? God is love. Very good. So we're going to ask some, some questions. We're going to apply our minds. Of course, that's very much in keeping with what the Bible asks us to do. Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind. All right. We're going to start by just sort of reviewing some of the things that we have been learning about what has happened with the history of the Christian church. And we've identified two major elements that began. You might recall the airplane analogy as the airplane just got started and things looked to be good. The airplane climbed, as it were, to about 10,000 feet. But then it began to encounter some difficulties. And we've identified two of those uh, major difficulties, not just we have identified, but scholars and historians have identified, that a major shift, a major what, everyone? Shift began to take place in the... Uh, Christian church, particularly in the 3rd, 4th, and 5th centuries and beyond. And that shift was really two sides of the same coin. Uh, the first was what scholars call the de-Judaization of the Christian faith, and that's just exactly what it sounds like, the un-Jewishing of the Christian faith. And uh, it was happening for a variety of reasons, but one of the main reasons was that the church was growing most rapidly among the Gentile community. Certainly there were some, uh, as the book of Acts uh, attests, there were a great number of Jews that were also coming to faith, but the church was growing more rapidly among the Gentiles, and the reason for that is frankly just mathematical. There were a lot more Gentiles in the Greco-Roman world than there were Jews. And so even if the church was growing at the same pace relative to population size, you're going to have many more Gentiles eventually than you would Jews. And those Gentiles began to exert a significant influence on the sort of shape of the church. And uh, what ends up happening over time is that there's nothing wrong, of course, with the Gentile community coming in, and I'm actually quite thankful for that, being a Gentile myself, a non-Jew, at least a genealogical Jew. But over time, it began to shape the church in ways that were unanticipated and that became deleterious to the church. It effectively uh, resulted in a severing of the church from its Jewish roots. And things that were regarded as Jewish were regarded as, as uh, not interesting or not important or not significant. And maybe I should just say a brief word about this. Part of this was that there was an antipathy, a significant antipathy between the Romans and the Jews. And the Romans had, had always thought of the Jews as sort of a primitive people and a backward people and, and a people that they just quite detested. For example, the, the Jewish practice of circumcision was considered particularly revolting by the Romans. And this idea of a rigid monotheism was considered you know, just really, really backward, really, really superstitious. The denial, for example, of the Roman state gods and, and other polytheistic ideas. So, so there was always this sort of um, hostility between the Romans and the Jews. Now, what ends up happening is when the Christians slowly uh, start to increase their Gentile population, fewer and fewer Jewish adherents and more and more Gentiles, again, that's just a product of growth, what happens is that the, the Christians, because they sense that there's a, a, a hostility or an antipathy between the Romans and the Jews, toward the Jews, the Christians start to slowly but surely over time, this happens sort of in the second and third centuries, align themselves more and more with the Roman interests. And part of that was because it was natural for them. They were most of them Gentiles anyway. And this, as we've already discussed, was really accelerated with the conversion of Constantine in AD 312. After the conversion of Constantine, the percentage of the Roman Empire that was either Jewish or Christian went from somewhere around 3 to not more than 4 or 5% to 60% in about two decades. So you had a massive, I mean almost incalculable influx of Greco-Roman and pagan influence just boom, 
overnight into the Christian church. And we mentioned the point that the church in those early centuries, uh, particularly the first and second, was able to, to endure persecution. But the question was, could they endure popularity? Right? You've heard the old saying, if you can't beat them, if you can't beat them, join them. And that's actually what the Bible says in the book of Revelation. If we had time and we were in a prophecy seminar, we could show that one of, one of Satan's most effective strategies is to, to not cause something to go uh, down by way of persecution and hostility, but actually just to flood it with popularity. And uh, I, I remember I read a biography a number of years ago about George Whitfield, and the very same thing was said about George Whitfield and what the Wesleys as well. When they would go into various towns in England, they would preach, and, and uh, people would come out and, oh, you know, what are you doing in our town? And they would throw tomatoes, and they would do terrible things, throw stones even at these men. And, but what would happen was is that as they were being persecuted in the various towns of England, as they were going as itinerant preachers, it only strengthened them in their resolve. It only furthered... Uh, to buttress their conviction. But then a shift began to take place and they went from persecuted to popular. And uh, the biographer of Whitfield, I remember this very well, he asked the question, Whitfield had endured persecution, could he, could he endure popularity? And that's basically what happened. That's the history of the Christian church, at least in this particular area, uh, this particular time rather, in a nutshell. They went from a persecuted minority to a strong, politically motivated majority, and it had massive implications for the church, one of which was the detachment, increasing detachment from the Jewish and biblical roots. Just to give you a, a little snippet, one little snippet here. The, the, the early Christian fathers, the, the fathers of the Christian church prior to the Council of Nicaea in AD 325 are called the Anti-Nicene Fathers. And uh, there's a number of church fathers that we could sort of list them, and we don't need to get into that right now. But among the Antonicene fathers, it is estimated that all but uh, maybe only one of them, and perhaps none of them, even wrote or spoke the Hebrew language. Now, just sort of let that sink in for a minute. These are the church fathers from the second and third and the beginning of the fourth centuries, and virtually none of them, almost all of them were Gentiles, Virtually none of them either read or write, or either read or speak Hebrew. Hebrew wasn't much of a spoken language at this point anyway. It was Aramaic. But they didn't know Hebrew. Now, it's going to be very difficult to really have a feel for the Old Testament scriptures if you don't have a feel for the Hebrew as well. Now, certainly there were translations. But the point is, it just shows the Jewish-Gentile disconnect, and over time that disconnection increased. Well... The reason that the de-Judaization was taking place is the flip side of that, and that's the other side of the coin, because something was, was filling up that vacuum space, and that's what's called Hellenization, or literally the Greeking of the church. And this served to bring pagan teachings and ideas into the church, and it was accelerated by the conversion of Constantine. So, so you remember the statement where John the Baptist said, I must decrease and he must increase? Well, that same basic idea is what's taking place here. The, the Jewishness of the early church was decreasing precisely because the Greek influence was increasing. And uh, I think it was maybe Tertullian, though I could be wrong about that, who early on in, in Christian history asked the question, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What has Athens to do with Jerusalem? In other words, he was basically saying that these are two totally different ways of thinking about reality. There's the Greek way of thinking about reality, that's Athens, and there's the biblical or the Jewish way of thinking about reality, that's Jerusalem. What hath Athens to do with Jerusalem? Well, with this idea in mind, the de-Judaization and the Hellenization of the faith, we see a number of significant failings, and that's really the nicest way to put it, but it's, it's the most accurate way to put it, failings of the early Christian church in seeking to gain more and more political popularity and political influence, a number of elements of paganism came into the church, but even more, or at least equally as tragic, was that many of the biblical elements had left the church. And they included, but were not limited to, the loss of the Seventh-day Sabbath, which we've already spent time on the beauty and the significance of that. God longs to spend time with us. The adoption of the immortality of the soul, which is part of what we're talking about here, which, which results in, number three, a perversion of the teaching of hell. And by the way, there are others. I'm just listing three of them here. 
We've just mentioned briefly in the past also a misunderstanding about the very nature of God. The Greeks viewed God by nature as a static and, and uh, even stoic entity that possessed a timeless perfectionism that is not in any way hinted at in Scripture. The God of Scripture is, is seen as a loving, passionate, uh, uh, interactive, dynamic Even a God that interacts with human beings in a spatio-temporal reality, that is in time and space, where the Greeks denied all of this. They they viewed God as as being perfect in a way that's kind of hard to describe because many of us have our own versions of perfect. But the Greek idea of perfection was the idea that God is is just perfectly static. He's, he's, He's not subject to change. He could not be subject to change. And therefore, any kind of emotion or passion or none of that could be attributable to God. Of course, you read the Bible, and the Bible is filled with indications that God experiences emotions. And it just makes sense, by the way. Human beings are patently emotional beings, yes or no? It's, it's part of what makes a human a human, right? And separates us from, say, robots or, or other things that don't have the kind of emotional landscape that we do. But we are made in the, what? Image of God. And so it stands to reason that if we are physical and psychological and emotional and social and all of that, that God possesses those elements to some degree as well. And uh, so basically what we have here is, is a And we we use the airplane analogy again, this idea that the airplane took off, got up to about 10,000 feet. But as early as the second, third, and especially getting into the fourth centuries, the the church begins to struggle and begins uh, begins to lose altitude, I guess decelerate, going down to 9,000, 8,000, and it gets into what is simply called the Dark Ages. And they're not called the Dark Ages because it was a great time, right? They're called the Dark Ages because it was quite the opposite, and we've already spent a little bit of time on that in our presentation, what's the deal with church? Well, right now we're going to see that this, this loss of, of biblical uh, primacy and this loss of, of a connection with, with the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish roots of the church, resulted in some really unfortunate teachings, not the least of which is a gross misunderstanding and a gross perversion of the idea of hell. And uh, frankly, if all that we knew, if all that we knew was this truth about God, this central truth that we've been building from, that God is love, and we've placed that first and foremost as both normative and non-negotiable on the table of truth. If that's all that we knew about God, we could know for certain by just employing our brains, by just thinking about it rationally and reasonably, that there is no possible way that that kind of a God, a God who is love in his very nature, a God who is love in his very essence, a God who is love in his character, a God who, as Paul repeatedly affirms, gave himself, he gave himself, he gave himself. There's no way that that God could tolerate or endorse the eternal suffering of his own creation in the fires of hell. There's just, that's an in, a, fun, a fundamental incompatibility that this God would endorse or allow or even, I suppose in some cases, some might suggest, enjoy the idea that, that there would be sinners, not, not just two or three or five, but, but potentially millions and multiplied millions of, of sinners in the fires of hell unendingly eternally. We say, where would that idea ever come from? What a, what a grotesque, perverse picture of God. Well, the idea basically comes from, a Greek think, from Greek thinking about the eternal spirit, that man possesses naturally an eternal spirit. But as we learned in our last presentation, God can give uh, believers the gift of eternal life, but it's just that. It's the gift of eternal life that was purchased for us by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Let me just quote for you two quick verses on that. The first is John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world, there it is, a God of love, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish. perish. Now let that sink in. Wouldn't perish. But have, what's the opposite of perishing? If you never died, you would have eternal life. Now notice what the text doesn't say. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not suffer unending conscious torment in the fires of hell, but have everlasting life. No, 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 no. Really, in a, in a significant way, both of those would be eternal life. One would just be a really unhappy, really terrible, really torturous eternal life, and the other one would be a bliss-filled and enjoyable eternal life. But both would be eternal life at some, at some level. 
But, but that's not what the text says. The text says, God gave his son so that we wouldn't perish, but have the opposite of perishing, which would be eternal life. And here's another one. You might know this one, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. These verses are just as plain as the noonday sun. This one says, the wages of sin, the ultimate payment of sin is death. Then it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, let that one sink in. The wages of sin is what? It's not eternal conscious torment in the fires of hell. Right, this is, this is just a wild idea. You have to read that idea into Scripture. No, the wages of sin is death, but the opposite of that is eternal life, which is a gift from Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you feel that? And so we're going to kind of unpack this from a variety of, of different angles, and I'm really looking forward to this. But our starting point is going to be, and we insist on this, that God is more than merely loving, an adjective describing a behavior or a characteristic, but say it with me, God is love. And we mention that when we bring other teachings, whatever those teachings might be, say this clicker represents a teaching, and this particular teaching is something that millions, tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of Christians believe that if you don't accept Jesus as your personal Savior, if you don't obey the gospel, if you don't turn your life over to Him, then you will suffer eternal conscious torment in the fires of hell. That's a belief that many people have, hundreds of millions. Frankly, I'm astonished that anyone could believe it, that you could get even one person to believe it. But there are hundreds of millions that believe it. And then so we're going to take this idea and we're going to bring it over here and we're going to set it on the table of truth. Okay? Now, we've already sort of established our methodology here and our methodology is that we're going to compare anything else that's making a claim to be on the table of truth with our cornerstone statement, our most fundamental statement about the nature of reality and the nature of God, and that is that God is love. And so we're going to say, are these two compatible? Is it actually possible to simultaneously affirm that God is love in his very nature, in his very essence, and in his very character, and also assume that he would allow, or in some theologies, cause sinners to suffer eternal conscious torment in the fires of hell? Can we affirm this and this at the same time? And my answer is absolutely not. This is A and this is non-A. This is black and this is white. This is square and this is circle. This is up and this is down, right? So now we're faced with a choice. We are faced with a choice. One of these two, because they are, they are incoherent. They cannot both be simultaneously affirmed. They are mutually exclusive ideas. We're either going to leave that one on the table and we're going to stick with our motif and our methodology and our, our cornerstone here that God is love or we're going to take that one off. We're going to say, well, he must be something else. And we're definitely sticking with this. We're going to stick with the idea that if you don't do the right thing in the way that God says, he will allow you or cause you to suffer unending conscious torment in the fires of hell. We're going to go with that as our building block. Oh, beloved, we're not going to go with that as our building block. And the good news is, is that there's no textual warrant to do so. There's no biblical warrant to even start with that as a building block. If you're going to start there, you are starting with the medieval and even pre-medieval. You're starting with a Greek idea of the nature of, number one, God. I mean, this, what kind of a God is this anyway? Is this the God that wants us to throw virgins into volcanoes to appease his wrath? Is that what we're after? Is that the kind of God that's portrayed in Scripture? Or we're going to start with a total misunderstanding of the nature of man as being naturally or inherently eternal, which Scripture also never teaches, and we've just mentioned that. Eternal life is a gift. It's a what, everyone? It's a gift. So even if all you knew about Scripture was, even if all you knew about this whole discussion was these three things. Number one, God is love, 1 John 4, 8. Number two, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have its opposite, everlasting life, John 3, 16. And all you knew was Romans 6, 23, for God, uh, excuse me, the wages of sin is death, but the converse, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ alone. If that's all you knew, 1 John 4, 8, John 3, 16, and Romans 6, 23, you would know enough to know that this belongs on the table and this is laughable. Actually, it's not laughable, it's tragically sad. It's sad that any one person would believe this uh, much less the fact that hundreds of millions... I remember, let me just sort of paint a picture here. I wasn't planning on talking about this, but I'll just quickly sort of paint the picture. I was asked, uh, oh, several years ago now, I suppose it's seven or eight years ago, to go to um, a sort of, um, oh, I guess it would be called an alternative Halloween party uh, in, um, 
California. It was actually in Antioch, California, the place I met my wife. And uh, I was invited to go, so I said, yeah, I'd go. And what it was was like a Christian alternative that was being put on by a large uh, community church. And uh, what they did was quite interesting. They, they basically rented a large theater, and uh, they put on a play. And uh, the play was supposed to be kind of scary, supposed to be kind of spooky, in keeping with the Halloween motif, rather than having kids out, you know, uh, putting on demon costumes and zombie costumes and other things. It was a Christian alternative. And so people came, and we were going to watch this play. And I don't remember the exact title of the play. But I can tell you what happened in the play. What the play was, was it was a, a variety of scenes, sort of like pictures of individuals' lives that are that are rapidly and unanticipatedly interrupted by death. And so one uh, was uh, per people on an airplane, and they're going, going, and then the airplane crashes. And then I'll tell you the scene in a moment. And then another was a car, and two people are talking, and then it, you know, it, cr it crashes. Another was somebody who got a little sickness in a hospital, but then it ended up getting infected, and they died, right? Now, in each instance, they would sort of, and I think they did, oh, I don't know, seven or eight of these scenes. What they would do is that... In, in certain instances, when the person would die, these really bright, shining, beautiful, you know, clothed in the requisite white uh, beings would come in to beautiful music. Oh, la, 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 la. And there's the dead body, you know, and they would, oh, in great, you know, pageantry, lift the body. Oh, la, la. And then the person would wake and, oh, big, oh, oh, and hugs and, oh, la, la. And then they would go, and everybody would clap. There's about, oh, probably 1,500 to 2,000 of us in the auditorium. But then in other stories, and they would do that story, and then they would do one of these stories. Somebody's driving, and like, oh, yeah, let's go get a beer, or whatever it was. You know, they really painted it up. It didn't, it didn't lack for, it didn't have much subtlety. Um, then, you know, there's a car accident, and then the lights would go low, and uh, they would start, Ooh, they would start to play this, you know, kind of creepy music and stuff, and then these, you know, black, bedecked, hooded beings would come out and Ooh, surround the body, and the person would wake up, ah! in sheer terror, and then whoa, they'd like carry the body out. And they just went back and forth with this. And uh, I, I was just astonished because people weren't getting into it. They were like, woo. And then when the other people, were like, oh, oh, oh. And, I, and I was sitting there like, are you kidding me? Like, oh, what, what, are, what is this? This is a Christian event. And then, as if that's not enough, you know, the point was sufficiently made. But then at the end of it, you know, the nice music begins to play. Just as I am without one plea. And, the, you know, the pastor gets up front, and ladies and gentlemen, tonight you have seen our church's humble reenactment of exactly what the Bible says happens when people die. Some will be whisked away into the bliss of eternal life, and others will begin to experience the fiery torments of hell. Now, which would you prefer? Tonight, we want to give the opportunity for those of you who want to turn your life over to Jesus, who love... And he begins to make this impassioned appeal, and he invites people to come forward. Well, surprise, surprise. <laughs> people come forward, right? But let me tell you, they're not coming forward, and here's the point. They were not coming forward because of the beauty of the goodness of the character of God. They weren't coming forward because God is so awesome. They were coming forward because they basically had been told, if you, if you die in that circumstance, if you don't make a decision right now and come up front and say the magic words, I confess that I'm a sinner, I have a need of a Savior, Jesus Christ is my personal Savior, amen. Whoo, you got saved on August 16th, 19, whatever, 99, or you know, whatever it was. Of course people are going to come forward. You present that kind of a ridiculous picture, particularly per, for people who are biblically illiterate, and this was considered an outreach. Now, my point here is basically this. Fine, I have no problem with churches reaching out to their communi community and trying to do it in ways that are in keeping with, you know, con contemporary things. You want to have a Christmas outreach, you want to have some kind of a Halloween outreach, fine. But this is, this is a joke. It's just laughable. I can remember as I was sitting there thinking, just this anger was just, this righteous indignation was just welling up within me, and it was everything I could do to keep my mouth shut. And in hindsight, I wish I hadn't. I wish I just stood up and said, uh, announcement, this is all completely ridiculous. Uh, if you'd like an actual Bible study on what the scriptures say about this topic, step outside, because I'm about ready to get kicked out. <laughs> 
I'll be right out front and I'll teach you what the Bible actually says. You are being brainwashed. This is ridiculous. God is not someone to be afraid of. I'll see you in about five minutes outside. But I wished I had done that because I just sat there kind of quietly taking it in. And uh, the, the, the point is basically this. First of all, fear is, is not, a, is not the, the primary motivator for coming to God. You do find passages in the Bible that say things like, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and I get that. But for the most part, that word fear is not a sheer terror. Ah! No, it's an appreciation and a deep reverential awe for the fact that God is God and you are dust. You're a human being. Yeah? In fact, repeatedly, I just think of Matthew chapter 17, when, when the Father appears and Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples' response immediately, uh, Peter, James, and John, whew, they fall right down to their face. And, uh, but it's interesting what the Bible says. The very next thing that Jesus says to them, the very next thing that they hear from Jesus is, don't be afraid. See, our natural inclination when God appears in all of his grandeur and glory would be to be afraid. On Mount Sinai, when God thunders from Sinai and the, the Israelites had become so accustomed to, to the pagan gods and idols of Egypt that never did anything. They were gods of wood and stone and metal, the frogs, the dogs, the hogs and the pollywogs, the sun and the moon and other things, a god to everything imaginable. They weren't accustomed to these gods actually doing anything, but when a real god shows up and really speaks with a really loud voice from a real mountain, they were terrified. And they actually said to Moses, man, we don't want to hear this guy's voice anymore. You go talk to him. You tell us what he said, because if he keeps speaking, we think we're going to die. They were afraid. And then Moses does the most interesting thing. He comes down from the mountain and he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Now, what he goes on to say is really interesting. This is Exodus 20, 20. He says, don't be afraid. God has just come down to make you afraid. <laughs> Actually, you can read this exactly what it says. Do not fear. God has just come down to make you afraid. And then it says, so you will not sin. In other words, the thing to be afraid of isn't God, it's sin. The real thing that we should be afraid of is the natural inclination of our own sinful selfish hearts. That's the thing to fear. That's the real thing to fear. But the thing to be in appreciative and reverential awe of, well, that's God. But the good news is that God is good. God is love. God is awesome. And this whole ridiculous caricature that was put on by that well-meaning church in California, that if you accept, you're in, and if you don't, you're out. Torturously out, terribly out, eternally out, tragically out. Come on. Really? Well, at some point, we're going to have to say, well, what does the, the scriptures actually say? And, and fortunately for us, if you had just these three passages, if you had only 1 John 4, 8, God is love, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whoever believes would not perish, and you had Ro Romans chapter 6, verses 23, uh, 23, the wages of sin is, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If that's all you knew, you knew enough. Okay, so our starting point here is that God so loved the world. But there are so many other passages. Passages like John chapter 16, verse 27. The Father himself loves you. And this is an important point that we have to understand. Jesus never taught that the Father was, you know, kind of out to get humanity. And Jesus was, was running interference for the Father. Like, I'll protect you from my dad, you know. And by the way, this is what actually began to emerge in the theology of the medieval church. God was so unapproachable, so, so almost awful and terrible that you had to have a series of intermediaries. Jesus wasn't a good enough mediator. You had to have the saints to mediate, to, to sort of run interference between God and... But then the saints weren't enough. Then you had to have Mary, the mother of Jesus, who's now also interceding. And then you have Jesus, who's, and then finally you get to the... Come on. Really? Is this, the, is this the picture of God? That, that, that there has to be a number? It, it, it's a little bit like, you know, what, uh, trying to get to a head of state or something. You have to go through, first through the secretary, then you have to, you know, make the appointment, and then you have to get past the bodyguards only to finally get an audience. No. No, 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 no. I read the Bible, and Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you. Come, come. On one occasion, I see the children coming to Jesus and uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus' disciples protesting and saying, leave the master alone, right? And Jesus says, no, 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 let the little children come to me. 
right? Even the child, even the prostitute, even the, 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 the publican, the Pharisee, or any other person, Jesus welcomed everyone into his presence. So this idea that the saints have to run interference, and then Mary has to run interference, and then Jesus has to run interference so that you can get to the Father, Jesus says, no, the Father himself loves you. By the way, listen to John 3.16 again. For God so loved the world. By the way, the God spoken of there in that particular text is the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Of course, the Son also loves. Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul here, man, language is just so big, so broad that, that he's just like reaching and trying to find adequate language. And he says, his great love wherewith he loved us. Other passages, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Notice here again, it's the Father's love. Romans chapter 8, verse 39. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And literally a bazillion other texts could, could be brought to bear on this. So many other texts that communicate, both Old and New Testament texts, that communicate that God's longing desire is to win, and we've been saying this again and again in our presentations here, is to win us, not with the force of his nature, the strength of his nature, but with the beauty of his character. God invites, God woos, God longs for us to come. I love the passage in Jeremiah. Is it Jeremiah 31 that says, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness I have drawn thee. Look at that. I've drawn thee. Well, what is, what is he drawing us with? With his character, with everlasting love. He has drawn us to himself. Jesus, on another occasion in John chapter 12, said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. Well, what are they drawn for? Because people say, what kind of a God would be hanging on a cross? What kind of an awesome God is that? A, a God who would come and walk a mile in our moccasins, who would live our life and move into our neighborhood and experience the ups, the downs, and the highs and the lows of, of, the, of the human experience. What, what an amazing God that is. And even for people who don't believe the story, as we've mentioned before, you have to appreciate the Christian story just for its, just for its aesthetic beauty. Right? If you just look at the history of Western civilization, and even increasingly um, Eastern as well, th th there's this idea that, that Jesus is without question, I would say, uh, the most singularly significant human figure ever born. I mean, who is this guy? People just largely, they're just drawn to him. There's just something about him. There's a humility and yet a boldness. There's a beauty and, and, yet, and, and yet there he is on a, what's going on? So notice here, I will draw all people to me. We've mentioned this before, but I've got to just quickly repeat it. The great story, what C.S. Lewis called the eternal mystery and the greatest miracle of, of, God's, um, of, of God's providence is that he, as the creator, would fashion a creation that was capable of resisting him. That was capable of resisting him. That is an eternal mystery, and it's the most beautiful truth of all. That he would give actual intelligence, actual will, actual volition so that he could be truly loved. But the flip side of that, as we've already talked about, love requires freedom. Freedom involves risk. The flip side of actual freedom is the possibility for resistance and for a, 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 a rejection of the very creator. And yet the great story is, is that, that God, rather than saying, what? You're not interested in having me? You turn your back on me? How could you? No, this isn't the story of Scripture. Right? The story of Scripture is not that God, God threatens us with his powers. Like, don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I could do to you? Don't you, do you want the ghouls to carry you off? No. What God does is he woos. He invites. He, he, he does so to such a degree that he himself becomes a man. And he says, let me, let me show you what I'm really like. He wins us with the strength and beauty of his character, not of his power and his nature. This is the biblical picture, and it's profoundly beautiful. And any misunderstanding of hell completely interrupts this basic idea, this basic perspective. Now, somebody's going to say, but what about all the texts that talk about fire and hell in the Bible? Well, let's deal with those. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, God is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should what? Perish, but that all should come to repentance. The desire of God's heart is for everyone to be saved. 
right? Now, he knows that that, eventu- that that will not eventuate and that some will choose, and this is the real uh, beauty and, in some ways, the tragedy of God's actual investment, of actual trust to other entities, and that's that he will honor their choice. And we have to do this with our children, too. We, at some point, you know, when they're 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, you know, we can sort of, in our nice, parental, gracious way, coerce them <laughs> to getting them to do what we want. But when they get to be 17, 18, 19, at some point, you just have to let them make their bad decisions. And this is the beauty of God. He loves us to no- Listen to this. He loves us enough to let us suffer the consequences of our own bad decisions. Do you get that? He loves us enough to let us suffer the consequences of our own bad decisions. And some will make a series of uninterrupted and unrepented of bad decisions. And at the end of time, God will honor their choice to live separate from him. So here it says, I've written the character of God, if it is to be understood rightly, must be understood in the light of the cross. Here God gave everything for the undeserving. As we've already mentioned, it is not possible to consistently affirm these two options. Number one, God is love. And number two, God causes or allows, depending on the theology, unsaved sinners to suffer for all eternity. So let's talk about hell. First of all, this is a bit of a piece of cake. And I don't mean to insult the intelligence of anyone who's here or anyone who's uh, from our viewing audience. I don't mean to, to insult your intelligence if you have believed it up to this point. But I want you to be liberated, liberated from any residual idea that this traditional view of hell is, is taught anywhere in Scripture. You can be free from the shackles of that tonight. As a little boy, I remember being terrified of hell because my, my mom, who was a bit of a... She was a bad Baptist, really, is what she was. She, was a, she did her best, but she was a bit of a bad Baptist, and my dad was a, my, the man that she married that became my father. was a bad Catholic. And so when a bad Baptist and a bad Catholic get together, they become Episcopalians. And uh, <laughs> that's what happened in my family. And uh, so prior to them becoming Episcopalians, where they don't really talk much about, you know, hell or any of that kind of thing. Uh, by the way, there are some great Episcopalians out there. No offense if you're an Episcopalian. Um, but uh, my mom would talk to me about hell, and she went to this kind of fundamentalist church. And these people were frankly terrifying. I, I, I just was terrified. I had nightmares as a young boy. I mentioned the other day that I was a dreamer. I've always been a dreamer. And I'd have these terrible nightmares of hell and, and, and the devil. And we had this great big family Bible. And uh, it was one of these family Bibles that has pictures in it. And one of the pictures was of Satan being cast out of heaven. And I was just haunted by that picture. I would be turning, oh, pretty picture of Jesus, pretty picture. And then I'd be, ah! And I turned, because this was the guy that if I didn't stop spilling my milk was going to torture me forever. I mean, I get past that guy. I mean, it's, it's crazy to think, but I literally grew up with, a, with an irrational and terrible fear of Satan and hell and the devil and, and eternity apart from my parents and lava and all of this craziness. And it was implanted in me by religious people. I tell you, there is no single doctrine that is more responsible for chasing people away from the goodness of God and the truthfulness of Scripture than this perverse teaching of hell. That's why I'm so passionate about it. This teaching right here, we got to address it. We got this is dirty laundry. And fortunately, there are a great many scholars and popular preachers, listen to this, not members of my church, in the evangelical world who are also coming to see, you know what, that doesn't quite add up. That doesn't quite add up. And I tell you, I praise God. You don't have to be a member of my church. That's your own business. Anytime someone comes closer to biblical truth, I'm going to say hallelujah. I'm going to say that's good news, right? If, If anybody is stumbling toward the truth, particularly this truth, I'm I'm thrilled absolutely thrilled whether or not they're a member of my own personal community of faith. And fortunately, that's beginning to happen. And I'll give you a few of those quotations in a moment. Well, the Old Testament word hell is translated 31 times. That word is found 31 times in, I think it's the New King James Version, which is the version that I typically use. Um, It's translated from the, the Hebrew word sheol, which doesn't have anything to do with eternity. It doesn't have anything to do with burning or any of that. It just means grave or place of the departed. Okay, so that's the first thing you have to kind of get in your mind, that the typical association that you have with hell is not the connotation of the actual Hebrew word that's used in the Old Testament, sheol. It means place of the departed or grave. The word itself definitionally has no connotation of burning or of fire or of eternity or any other such thing. It means the grave. Okay? Now, we've already seen that both the Old and the New Testaments teach consistently, universally, that when you die, you sleep the sleep of death and await the resurrection. That's both Old Testament and New Testament. 
Sleep the sleep of death and await the resurrection. And so in Hebrew thinking, when you died, you went to the place of Sheol. You slept, right? You weren't in some place of writhing, neither were you in some place of bliss. That didn't happen until the resurrection, and Jesus affirmed that basic teaching. Now, in the New Testament, hell occurs 23 times. There are two Greek words. There's actually three, but one is only used once, so I'm just going to use two. There are two Greek words that are translated as hell, Hades and Gehenna. Of these, that should say two words. Only the last one has the connotation of burning or fire. Hades is very similar to the, to the Hebrew word Sheol. It means place of the departed, grave. Okay? Now, the word Gehenna, which is used several times in the New Testament, does actually have the idea of burning and of destruction. And the word Gehenna is an important word. You can do a little study on it if you'd like. It doesn't occur much in the New Testament, but when it does, it's frightful. I don't want to in any way suggest that hell is not a frightful thing, that being separated from God eternally is not frightful. It is frightful. But the idea of, Ge of Gehenna actually is a contraction of, of two words, Gehinnom, Hinnom. And uh, Hinnom, the Valley of Hinnom, was a place just to the south of Jerusalem, and it was essentially a valley that ended up being more or less the Jerusalem city dump. And it was the place where refuse was put, and uh, things that were discarded, things that were not, you, you didn't want anymore. Well, if, if an animal died, a, a cow or a goat or whatever that was not fit for slaughter, it was also thrown in the Jerusalem city dump, in the valley of Hinnom. Things were, and in order to keep the volume low, as they used to do up until just modern times, you, just can, you kept a fire burning in the Valley of Hinnom to just keep the, the volume low. So things would be thrown in there, and you'd have sort of smoldering fires here, there. And if the volume got high, you'd have to burn it down, etc. And so in Jewish thinking, and uh, in, in, in the actual etymology of the Hebrew word, Gehenna just means a place of total destruction or total annihilation. Now... Things get really interesting here because if you had some sort of organic material such as, you know, produce or food or, again, an animal that wasn't fit for slaughter or even a human being that was maybe just a derelict that nobody knew who he was and they didn't know what to do with him, nobody was around to provide him with a proper and honorable burial. I mean, even people could be thrown into the Jerusalem city dump. It's, I mean, that was a rare exception, but it could happen. People could be thrown in there. And what would happen was, if the fires did not quickly consume, especially the organic material, well, what would happen was what happens anytime you have a natural decomposition, and that is that worms or maggots uh, would begin to fill the corpse and to devour it. So you had sort of two things that were happening there in the Valley of Hinnom. Fire was consuming, and worms were eating up the biological material. And to, to Jewish thinking, to a Jewish mind, anybody who was living and understanding uh, what Gehenna actually meant etymologically... It meant a place of total destruction. It, it meant a place of total destruction. And so when the Bible does speak of Gehenna, it doesn't mean that it's an eternally burning fire that goes on and on and on and on because a human being possesses an eternal soul. It means it's a place of total destruction. Total destruction. Now, we know this because in the New Testament, when, the, when those that rebel against God are finally and fully detached from God, when, and this is the best way to say it, when God finally and fully honors their decision to live apart from Him, we know what happens. Let me just say a quick word on that. I run a school, and the school that I run is called Arise. And at the school Arise, we've had hundreds of students over the last 12 years, and we, we have had to ask a few students to leave, to kick them out. Very few, actually. Um, I think less than 10 in the hundreds of students that we've had. But when it is time for us to ask a student to leave, we don't ever say, we're kicking you out. No, 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 no. What we say is this. We say, we are honoring your decision to leave. Right? You have made it clear by your actions that this is not a good fit for you. This is not where you want to be. This is not the place for you. So we're not coming in and arbitrarily kicking you out. No, 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 no. We are simply here to honor the decisions that you are making. Do you hear the difference? And uh, we say, hey, we're sorry we have to do that, but we've talked to you about this before, and now you've made it clear to us that we have no choice but to honor your own decision. That's hell. When God finally and fully honors the decision of those who say, we don't want to have anything to do with you anymore, God. We want, as it says in Revelation chapter 6, to be hidden from the Lamb. When, you be, when, when the Bible says, hide us from the Lamb, the wicked are crying out, let the rocks and mountains fall on us, hide us from the Lamb. Well, listen, if you're hidden from the Lamb and the Lamb is the source of life, well, then death is the inevitable consequence. So we know what happens because Revelation chapter 20, verse 9 describes this. And if this were a prophecy seminar, I would go right through this in great detail. But let me just show you the basic picture. 
They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints. That's the wicked. That's the unsaved and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven. And what did it do? It devoured them. Now, we know that this cannot last eternally. Now, in a sense, it does last eternally in terms of its effect. The effect is an eternal effect. In other words, there's no resurrection from this. The Bible actually calls this the second death. But it's not an ongoing and eternal experience. And we know that because look at what happens. Revelation 20 verse 15 says, Anyone not found, in written, in the, not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That is the very thing that's being described in verse 9. They're devoured. Now watch what happens. The next thing that John sees, I saw a new heaven and a new what? Earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Well, you know that that cannot be continuing to go on and on and on and on because hell takes place on this earth after the millennium when the new Jerusalem comes down and the unregenerate go to try to take by force what they re refuse to receive by grace and fight. Did you hear that? They try to take by force what they refuse to receive by grace and the fire <laughs> devours them. And the next thing that John sees is a new heaven and a new earth. So clearly the fire was temporal. The fire served a purpose, and the purpose was simply to cleanse the earth and to clean it of sin and sinners. Now, here's where things get really interesting. The fire is God himself. That's where things get amazing. The fire is not some arbitrary little campfire that God starts up. God himself is that fire, and I want to show you that in just a moment. The New Testament has verses like this, Jude chapter 1, verse 7, speaking of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an, what's that word? An example. What kind of an example? Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Right? So it says Sodom and Gomorrah, Gomorrah are an example of eternal fire. But that raises the question, are Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today, thousands of years later? Of course not. They burned up. They burned up. Eternal fire is not fire that burns eternally. Eternal fire is fire that has eternal consequences. Right? And notice this one from Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into what? What were they turned into? Ashes. Right? Like any combustible material, when they had burned up, the fire went out. Condemned them to, what's the next word? Destruction. Making them an example. There's that word again, to those who would afterward live ungodly. The unsaved in the New Testament and the Old are both crystal clear on this. The Bible says, for example, they will die. We've spent time in Romans 6, 23. They will perish. That's what Jesus said in Luke 13, 3. They will be burnt up, Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. They will be utterly consumed, Psalm 37, verse 20. They will be turned into ashes, Psalm, or excuse me, uh, Malachi chapter 4, verse 3. They will be as though, that should say, they had not been, Obadiah 16. Satan himself will be totally destroyed, Ezekiel 28, 18. Even Satan does not possess eternal life. According to the prophecy about Satan's rebellion in Ezekiel 28, and even Isaiah 14 hints at it as well, Satan himself will be destroyed. Satan doesn't get eternal life, and he certainly doesn't get eternal life to do the thing that he loves to do, which is to harass and to bother and to harangue the children of God. Is that, I mean, is that what's happening? Come on. Does God keep the devil on the divine payroll throughout unending eternal ages? I mean, there are some people that believe these things. Come on. The biblical picture is so clear if we will but disabuse our minds of the Greek thinking and the idea, number one, that God is this kind of a God to ah, be afraid of and run and fear from, and number two, that man possesses an eternal soul. When you pull the rug out from underneath both of those pictures, first of all, a grotesque and horrific picture of God, we can pull that out because Jesus on the cross is the picture of God, God giving everything for the undeserving. And this idea that man possesses an eternal soul, we can pull that out as the pagan and Greek idea that it is and see that it's found nowhere in Scripture, but eternal life is a gift that God gives to us when we receive Jesus' faithfulness on our behalf. So far, so good? So now there's no reason to believe that. And here's a question I've got. And I know that there are, are people out there, and perhaps even some here, who say, no, I'm going to cling to this belief. This is what I've always believed, and I think that this is what Scripture teaches. Let me just ask you this question. Why would you want to believe that? Right? What do we think about Hitler? What do we think about Stalin? What do we think about these people who, who right now the United States is debating, what do we do with Syria? Because, you know, their president purportedly, you know, threw chemical weapons on, you know, 13 or 14 or 1,500 of his own citizens. And we think, oh, what a monster. Oh, what a terrible guy. If, in fact, it's the case. I have no way of knowing. I've never been to Syria, and I haven't seen that. But we're saying, oh, these are terrible people. And we have no doubt about the Hitlers and the Mussolinis and the Pol Pots and the others. But, but all they could do was kill the body. What kind of a God is God if he puts people into the oven and then lets them writhe and turn and stay there in some sort of disembodied, eternal, torturous experience? Really? 
Why would anybody want to believe that? And I know that there are many well-meaning evangelicals that say, well, I don't want to, but I'm going to believe it anyway. Well, I want to tell you today, you don't have to believe it. There's no scriptural warrant to believe it, and there's no common sense reason to believe it, and it doesn't square with the picture of God, a God as love of Christ hanging on the cross. A man by the name of E.W. Fudge wrote a book a number of years ago, more than 20 years ago, called The Fire That Consumes. And I have great appreciation for Dr. Fudge because he was an evangelical that spoke out. He's one of those voices that spoke out against this particular picture of God. And in his book, The Fire That Consumes, which became a bellwether book for evangelical thinking on this, he basically said, no, this idea, we have to forsake this idea because it is just not textual and it's not grounded in the goodness of God. Here he's writing about the particular word forever because the Bible does speak, for example, in the book of Revelation as the smoke of their torment ascending forever and ever. And people will point to that and say, see, forever and ever. It means that it happens through unending eternal ages. But the point that Fudge makes, and it's a point that common sense would make as well, is that forever is a word that modifies the thing that it's describing. It's a word that has a different context depending on what it's saying. For example, it's true in the English. It's true in the English as well as in the Greek. For example, if I say, oh, I went to the DMV today and I stood in line forever. Okay, how long did I stand in line? Yeah. Knowing our modern impatient society, I was probably there for 20 minutes. <laughs> right? Or if I say, oh, I don't want to wash all these dishes, sweetheart. We had a, well, how come nobody stuck around to help us after the party? This is going to take forever. How long is it going to take me to wash those dishes? Hour maybe? Right? Or, and there's many biblical instances of this. For example, Jonah says that when he was in the belly of the fish, he was there forever. Well, if you were in the belly of a fish, it would feel like forever too, right? He was there for three days. The Bible says that, that Samuel was, was given by Hannah to the priest to serve him forever. Well, that just meant for his life. It didn't mean throughout unending eternal ages. It just meant for his life. In the, in the Old Testament, the Bible speaks about a, a person, if they make a decision to become a, a willful servant, an indentured servant, they, are, they have their ear pierced with an awl, and it says when that happens, that he will serve his master forever. But based on the Jewish economy, that would last for six years, and all debts were released and all slaves were released on the seventh year. Um, the sabbatical year, and then that also happened on the Jubilee, the 7th, 7th. And so forever didn't mean throughout unending eternal ages for trillions and trillions and trillions. No, it just meant as long as it lasts, depending on the nature of the object being described. Basically what it means is without interruption until cessation. Without interruption until cessation. And here is the point that Fudge makes. The word in Greek, ionios, means forever, but within the limits of the possibility inherent in the person or thing itself. When God is said to be eternal, that is truly forever. When the mountains are said to be everlasting, same word, that means that they can last, that they last ever so long, so long as they can last. Do you see the difference? The word forever is relative to the thing that it's describing. If we're talking about God reigning forever, well, God as an object, that's going to modify our understanding. If I stood in line forever, or if the mountains last forever, or if I was in the belly of a fish forever, all of the forevers there mean without interruption until cessation, depending on the object being described. So far, so good. And we've already learned that a human being does not possess an eternal soul. So if a human being is placed into the fires of hell, which we're going to see in just a moment, is a choice to fully and finally separate yourself from God, that doesn't, the consequences last eternally, but the experience doesn't last eternally. No, you're gone. You perish. You die. The second death, the Bible calls it. I love this one. This is from another bellwe bellwether evangelical, a man by the name of John Stott, who wrote one of the classics titled The Cross of Christ. He says, as a committed evangelical, my question must be and is, not what does my heart tell me, but what does God's word say? Can you agree with that? This is why I'm happy. Anybody, I don't care what church you're a member of. You can be a Baptist, you can be a Pentecostal, you can be a Seventh-day Adventist, you can be a Catholic, you can be an Orthodox, you can be whatever. If you are saying, I'm going to make God's word my standard, then you and I are on the same team. We're singing out of the same hymnal, so to speak, and we're reading out of the same Bible. And in order to answer this question, we need to survey the biblical material She's saying, let's go back and look at this afresh and open our minds, not just our hearts, to the possibility that Scripture points in the direction of, what is that word? Annihilation. And that the doctrine of eternal conscious torture has to yield to the supreme authority of Scripture. Oh, I couldn't agree more, Mr. Stott. 
It cannot, I think, be replied that it is impossible to destroy human beings because they are immortal. And here he hits it right on the head. For the immortality and therefore the indestructibility of the soul is a Greek, Greek not a... Thank you, Mr. Stott, for that absolutely perspicacious and accurate, accurate evaluation. That is exactly correct. You cannot say it's impossible to destroy human beings because that's not a biblical concept. The Bible says in Ezekiel 18, the soul that sins, it shall die. We've already quoted John 3.16 and others. E.W. Fudge again quickly in the fire that consumes pagan Greek thought patterns entered the Christian stream early in its history and have flowed along almost unnoticed for many centuries. And that's the point. That this idea is a Greek idea. It is not a biblical idea. And I mentioned just a moment ago this idea that God himself is the fire. And I'm just going to go through a few texts here. I'll just quote this one quickly. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says, This then is the message that we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, Our God, for our God is a consuming fire. You see, beloved, what actually happens when Jesus returns is that the glory, the mighty glory of his un... Uh, 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 not fettered, but un uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uncovered and fully disclosed personhood. That that it is so glorious, so grand, so powerful, and so selfless and loving. That is exactly as the Book of Revelation says: those that want nothing to do with the character of God and the goodness of God, they run and they hide from the glory of God. But eventually, that glory just <laughs> consumes them, wraps them up. In fact, it's just another way of saying that they refuse to live in the light of God's love and they are eventually consumed by it. Now, let me just read you a passage. This will be our final verse here. Isaiah 33. This is one of the most interesting passages in this regard. And we'll pick it up in verse 14. Isaiah 33, verse 14. It says, For the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? And who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings. Oh, there it is. Who will dwell with the, with the devouring fire and the everlasting burnings? But watch what the answer is. He who walks righteously and he who speaks uprightly. He who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes, who stops his ears from the hearing of bloodshed and who shuts his eyes from seeing evil. He will dwell on high. His place in defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him and his water will be sure. This is an amazing thing. What Isaiah is saying, the sinners are afraid. Who will dwell in the everlasting flames? Well, do you know what the everlasting flames are? God's own presence. Our God is a consuming fire. Who will dwell in the everlasting frames and flames? And then he answers the question, the upright. Those that refuse bribes, those that don't want to hear about bloodshed, those that have put their, their life inside of the parameters of the kingdom of God, those that are trusting to Jesus, they will dwell in the very presence of God, just as God had said to Moses, no man can see my face and live. But after redemption, after we have been sealed, after we have been glorified, we will all live in the presence of what would otherwise be everlasting burnings, God's own unmuted, unobstructed character but because we long to love as He loved, to live as He lived, to, to, to walk as He walked, and we want no selfishness or sinfulness or rebellion in us, there's no combustible material in us to be consumed. We dwell with God through unending eternal ages in the light of the glory of His love.